Ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to welcome you all to this web webinar on defending and renewing multilateralism, Estonia and Norway in the United Nations Security Council. My name is Kristin Heigvik. I'm a senior research fellow here at NUPI, the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs. And this webinar is part of the project with the same name as the seminar, namely uh, Defending and Renewing Multilateralism, which is fin financed by the EEA Norway grants under the bilateral funds, and it is carried out in co collaboration with NUPI and the FP, the Estonian Foreign Policy Institute. We are really happy to see that so many have signed up for this event today, uh, and we believe it will be a highly interesting exchange, and which is also highly relevant, we think, beyond Estonia and Norway. We know that there are many people in the audience and we know many people have questions. Uh, it is possible to send questions into this event. Uh, you can use the Q&A function and for people who don't have questions, but who really like questions that other people pose, it's also possible to use the like function in Teams uh, where you could rate questions so that you push them up our agenda. Now, the context here is, of course, that there is increased uncertainty, there is increased turbulence in global politics today. And today is, is no exception. We are keenly awaiting the results from the US presidential elections, and the outcome there is also going to have a major impact on how multilateral institutions evolve in the coming years. And in 2021, Norway and Estonia will both be members of the UN Security Council. And that will be the year they overlap. Estonia has already been a member for a year, whereas Norway is joining uh, next year and sitting through 2022. So what's the point at this seminar of grouping these two states together and using them as an entry point for a wider discussion? Well, we believe there are good reasons to do so. So firstly, Norway, uh, Norway and Estonia are both relatively small states. And so the framework conditions under which they operate are fairly similar. Secondly, Norway and Estonia represent the Nordic Baltic region, which has risen on the foreign policy agenda of the eight states constitutive of it. And 2021 will actually be the first time where, the, where two states from this region serve on the Security Council at the same time. Thirdly, Norway and Estonia share some thematic priorities which can bring them together in the Security Council, including support from multilateralism and a rules-based international system, climate change and uh, an interest in cybersecurity. We have four excellent speakers here today from both the practitioner and the researcher side to help us get a broader understanding of the possibilities and limitations for small states in the Security Council, and especially for Estonia and Norway to find common ground on issues they are both interested in putting on the agenda. We have Lise Lipriyerma and Andreas Lövel, who represent the Estonian and Norwegian MFA respectively. And we have Christy Reich and Nils Schia, who represent FP and NUPI. I will introduce the speakers in more detail as we go along. Our first speaker is Lise Lipriyerma, who is head of the Office of International Organization and Human Rights at the Estonian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And she will give us a perspective from Tallinn. So Lise, uh, the floor is yours. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Thank you very much for hosting this uh, event and bringing us together despite the difficult traveling circumstances. I'm glad we can celebrate the Norwegian upcoming membership in the Council. Congratulations to Norway. Impressive 130 votes, which me meant you got elected with the first round and uh, you enjoy two thirds of majority of the General Assembly. That's a great trust. And uh, I know how fierce the competition is to get a seat. We are very gl glad, as was mentioned, that the Nordic Baltic region is represented in the Council now. I'm honored here to make observations of our membership so far. The key question, how to measure a success, can elected member make a difference? Um, we've seen uh, from our region, Sweden, for example, and we can reply, yes, they can. Sweden uh, set uh, the very, very good uh, milestone to all of us uh, with an active uh, program in the Council. And uh, finally, I'd like to offer a few remarks about the temperature in the Council. So uh, 
I would start by saying that it's a great responsibility to be a council member as well as an opportunity. We take it seriously. Uh, the starting point being uh, what is the council and what it isn't when we start our discussion, what can be achieved? So I think it's important, first of all, to understand the council mostly manages conflict and rather seldom resolves them. It often, as is said by one analyst, it shames countries into action, uh, meaning it's an a public diplomacy arena, a deterrent communication uh, a landscape or arena. What I mean by that is that half of the council meetings are open to the public. They are webcast. The trend towards more open meetings uh, is there, meaning that some criticize it, uh, takes away the council functionality. On the other hand, uh, it makes it possible to use the council as a messaging uh, arena, as a public diplomacy arena. So, uh, yes, it is not a place only to adopt resolutions, although the resolutions are important. There are 14 peacekeeping missions which are mandated by the Security Council. So, Council is the main policy making body of uh, the peacekeeping policy, and it is indeed very important. Uh, it is a prominent pressure mechanism to the parties to the conflict and it helps to keep the public eye on grave sufferings uh, that ordinary people are under. So uh, this is uh, where the elected member has a responsibility to make use of this arena in a most, uh, most um, useful way to save lives, alleviate human sufferings, keep global attention on grave uh, human rights violations and via that make a small step towards preventing mass atrocities maybe. Uh, last but not least, the arena of course is a, a place where big powers manage their tensions and for smaller ones it is important that the big powers have a stable relationship to each other and uh, academia and analysts have long written that the council is namely the first, the one and only place where the eye to eye contact between big powers is there Ironically, the COVID uh, pandemic has thrown us all to the video diplomacy. The Council is back to the video screens. That it has, has taken away, uh, at least for a certain period of time, an opportunity for countries to act face to face interaction for diplomats, which is our main tool of uh, doing our work. So it is to be, uh, to be um, researched in the future. What's the impact? of such diplomacy, diplomacy from our living rooms to the outcome of uh, multilateral um, relations and multilateral policy. Focus of Estonia and Norway, as was mentioned, we are very uh, glad that we share main, main priorities. I'd like to highlight the human rights agenda often pioneered by elected members and here the Nordic countries have always been uh, norm setters uh, when we talk about the United Nations um, context especially. And allow me to remind that uh, it was only in the 1990s that for example sexual and gender based violence gained political attention, attention necessary to establish norms by the Security Council and for example include these aspects to the peacekeeping mandates. Grave human rights violations were not seen as inevitable consequences of the war. It is still a debate between the various council members on this aspect. Shall I discuss human rights grave violations there or not? Awful crimes in Rwanda and Bosnia pushed the council to react and act and build up uh, the normative framework. And uh, for example, uh, then council established 20 years ago Women, Peace and Security Agenda which currently this month we are celebrating 20th anniversary. And just recently, last week, the Council failed to adopt a celebratory or commemorative resolution on this very agenda item. And why it failed? Namely, because there was a pushback uh, in the text to go back uh, on the human rights language, what we had agreed long time ago. And the history was made in this sense that 10 countries abstained. The number of abstentions, um, what I have read, uh, is a very rare occasion, maybe the only one. And five were in favor of this resolution. So this symbolizes the era we are uh, entering or we are currently in. There is a pressure towards commonly agreed norms to be maybe um, 
rewritten. And here, Norway, Estonia, I am sure, can make a good partnership together with other elected members to build a coalition uh, against this trend. For Nordic Baltic region, uh, security situation, security policy is highly important. Estonia, uh, for us, uh, a central issue is that national borders must not be shifted by force. And every country should have the right to make its foreign and security policy decisions. As a council member, we stand for that principle as well. Uh, we've seen the trend now in the region that the security situation deteriorates. Here I speak about grave human rights violations in Belarus, Nagorno-Karabakh, Ukraine and Georgia being already in the agenda. So the voice from our region to bring up these issues, to keep a focus on these issues, to make sure the council discusses these matters and keeps the pub, um, helps to keep the public attention on these situations is very important. Mm, cybersecurity, the rules international law we've established apply to the cyberspace. That's the point Estonia, to hopefully together with other partners, is pursuing step by step also in the council context. And in the multilateral uh, diplomacy, Norm, norm building takes decades, as we've seen with the human rights uh, normative framework. So overnight, we won't change anything, but we will set the building blocks foundation for the future discussions. And we hope to do that together with Norway. On issues of uh, non-traditional security policy, climate change and deteriorating security environment, the interlinkages between these two, this is an important new issue the council is set to address and here i hope we again build a good coalition in july all elected members convene together an open debate on this very matter so i would hope that the elected members are those who will take this agenda forward uh, germany will be out of the council germany has shown great leadership uh, prior to that sweden headed this dossier so we hope uh, this will not uh, uh, not stay in the drawer and will pursue. Uh, to put it shortly, the idea is to give the Secretary General a mandate on this file to make a research, to gain data and report back to the Secretary, uh, Security Council so that the Council would have a good knowledge to suggest policies itself in the future. Working methods and practices, always a topic for elected members. Elected members have this disadvantage that they don't know the framework where they are stepping in. We are so glad that Norway, for example, now can observe the council meetings. That's another new thing. It's, uh, it was, I think, very recently that the members were elected and they had to enter the council next month without any preparatory phase. So we are glad that the elections take place six months prior to the entering the council. That's already a a good phase of preparing yourself, uh, learning the landscape so that it makes it more, uh, uh, it, it makes it easier to have an impact then. And uh, where else can we make an impact? Um, uh, we can, as an elected member, shape, discuss and bring issues on the table. There are different formats in the Council and smart uh, usage of these formats enables to be a convener. We can raise the topics, involve, invite briefers, this is a work of a like-minded coalition. You always have to work uh, with the like-minded countries. Mm, but it is possible, we've uh, experienced it ourselves. A tool of public statements, an important tool, because council is divided in, on many issues. As I mentioned, human rights, but there is a huge divide. We know that grave suffering in Syria now is uh, without a response from the council. So this makes it even more important that like-minded countries convene for a public joint statement. And this tool, is being widely used um, by uh, European Union member states, sometimes joining with other like-minded countries. We hope Norway uh, can be also this country to join us, as we know that our uh, views on security defense issues are very much um, the same. So um, it is important for us to stand for regional security issues and be a credible voice on that, bring these issues to the limelight. Um, as well as uh, allow me to make a small, small comment on our uh, experience as a presidency, the COVID pandemic. So this hit us in March. The council was forced to the uh, people had to work from homes. So uh, 
that set a challenge. Uh, could the council work? Uh, could it continue be, to be uh, visible to the outside audience? Can we convene meetings with other UN members? So in May, our aim was uh, to convene also meetings with other UN members. There were two months pause at the UN when countries convened due to the COVID. So in May, when we had the presidency, we uh, set the aim to arrange uh, informal council meetings so that other council members could attend. We commem commemorated Second World War, um, important anniversary, and we are glad that 80 countries con attended this meeting. It was first time after the COVID that UN family could come together. Then we convened the meeting on cyber security, working methods and protection of civilians. This is just an example that uh, an elected member, at least once, a, once being a presidency, can have certain time slots when topics which are being discussed in the council can be defined by this member. So we learned that um, despite of the small population we are having, we can set certain standards. For example, when it comes to organizing virtual multilateral diplomacy, uh, we can influence the agenda as well as set new standards for UN video diplomacy. Mm. So, uh, to, for the future cooperation, we with Norway, we hope to plan uh, also certain events definitely together uh, with other like minded countries. There are ma many different opportunities uh, to show leadership. Um, it is yet to be seen if we can hold. Um, if we can lead a certain topic in the council, it's called pen holder. Pen holder is a country, all countries who together jointly draft resolutions, bring up issues with a certain file. We hope to announce that uh, later. Uh, Cyber security, we will pursue that there will be a discussion on that and we are ready to raise these issues once we see cyber attacks uh, taking place. And um, now finally, uh, Allow me to make a remark, some remarks on council dynamics. Um, I think it's important uh, to understand that most of the resolutions of the council are adopted by consensus. Just from the news, we are reading those which have split votes or vetoes. So statistically speaking, we don't do these difficult negotiations on, on a monthly basis even. Sometimes there are months when we, when we don't have any uh, veto question or any huge discrepancy. However, the trend is that there are more procedural votes and more vetoes since 2011, mainly connected to the Middle East situation, Syria. China and Russia are doing tandem vetoes, a new trend. Um, so this also illustrates the atmosphere and the split atmosphere in the Council. Another example is the COVID crisis. Uh, when the COVID hit, uh, then the linkage with the security environment, um, the Council failed to do. Uh, it failed to address, I think, three months uh, before the resolution was adopted. The Secretary General of the UN was a very visible leader during that time announcing uh, the Global Peace uh, Ceasefire Initiative and the Council failed to get behind his back on that. So this is yet another example of uh, the tensions between big powers and uh, despite the fact that the elected members were also trying its best uh, to get the Council um, be vocal on this issue, get behind the Secretary General. It took three months and uh, with the leadership of France and Tunisia, finally the, in June, the resolution uh, was adopted. Um, Antonio Guterres has uh, described the situation uh, as the following, and I cite, a looming risk of world splitting in two with the United States and China creating rival internets, currency, trade, financial rules, and their own zero-sum geopolitical and military strategies. So that's an open statement by the Secretary General, who also echoes the worry. Um, worry. So uh, finally, um, there will be a new uh, membership, new elected members as of January. We have Norway, also Ireland, Kenya, India, and Mexico joining. So it's being uh, always said that every new season, when the new elected members come, certain dynamics will change. It is to be seen how it affects us uh, with Norway and Ireland, I'm sure uh, we'll build a good uh, like-minded uh, circle. Uh, to conclude, uh, yes, we live at times where predictability is uh, not the norm, uh, but the exception. Also in the Council, there are often, uh, often dynamics which are uh, surprising and we need to do rapid decision-making and coordinating with uh, like-minded countries. 
However, in most of the files of the Council, the wider like-minded alliance is very much the same uh, when it comes to human rights policy and um, uh, big uh, security policy issues. Mm. So, as I mentioned, there is a uh, number of vetoes which is trending. Uh, there is um, uh, some uh, among the permanent members the relationship between them defines much of the atmosphere of the Council. Of course, we are all affected by their policies. And uh, to, to conclude with, I would like to say that uh, despite all these difficulties and the fact that uh, there might be, there are a difficult relationship also among permanent members, the moral voice of a small and elected country is even more acute and important in this context. And uh, when I was beginning uh, by describing what can be achieved and what not in the Council, then I would also like to wrap up with that, that let's make most use of these tools and this arena and be a loud and vocal voice on issues where maybe uh, large countries are unable to agree upon. Thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction from the existing member. Uh, and now we will hear from the incoming member. So we will hear from Andreas Löwel, who is the director of the section for coordination of UN Security Council Affairs here at the Norwegian MFA. And he will give us an Oslo view on things. Andreas, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Christine. And, and many thanks to NUPI and uh, EFPI for organizing uh, this seminar. Um, and also thanks to my Estonian friends um listening to Lise now reminds me of uh, you know how like-minded the Estonia and Norway are and, and how that will strengthen during uh, one year together in the council uh, to be time efficient I, I have uh, structured just a few main points uh, so I will take them um, but I would just say that um, uh, I think actually it's first time that uh, Nordic Baltic states are together at the same time in the council. Uh, so, uh, so that's uh, on, the, on a very positive note. Uh, just as a starting point, uh, a few reflections in terms of uh, the elections that took place mid-June. Um, clearly for Norway, uh, it was a very huge win uh, by, by getting 130 votes. Uh, that sends a very strong message uh, as a vote of confidence and trust, uh, not just in our campaign, but uh, but uh, with respect to our values and interests in, in general terms and, and our foreign policy and our engagement uh, within the UN system uh, uh, at large, not just uh, in, in, uh, in the individual institutions, but uh, multilateral cooperation uh, in, in general terms. I think it's kind of a confirmation of, of uh, Norway's consistent uh, support uh, to, um, uh, you know, politically, financially and morally as well in terms of strengthening uh, international institutions and, and working from within those institutions in making those as efficient as possible um, and standing up for uh, rule of law, international law, including human rights uh, law and uh, international humanitarian law. Um, so, so in a way that, of course, have, have given us a boost uh, in terms of uh, where we are now uh, with preparations. Uh, but, but I think as a general message uh, from my side, this doesn't mean that we need really to change our policy. Of course, we need to expand uh, our policies on, on some files because the council is involved, like what Lise was referring to. Uh, a more expanded agenda with uh, involved in very many more countries and, and also thematic files compared to when we were in the council last time in 2001 and 2. Uh, so we are very prepared and very ready uh, to utilize the system we have, our policies. Um, we are present uh, in, in all the regions uh, through our embassies or, or diplomatic networks. Um, and, and we are very ready to, to work from within the system in, in doing what we can in, in uh, making the council more or as most efficient and inclusive as possible. Uh, that's just kind of a starting point. My second point was to just briefly uh, 
mention a few kind of uh, main lines in terms of where the council is today compared to 20 years ago when we were in the council last time. Like, uh, I mean, I don't need to repeat Lee's uh, presentation, but obviously the council in a way is, has expanded in terms of activity, in terms of numbers of meetings, uh, the more public meetings than ever. Um, and it goes ups and downs a little bit in terms of the number of conclusions. Uh, but in terms of activity, it's uh, there's a lot of energy there. Um, so uh, so in that way, it's uh, in a way it's a more demanding body uh, to prepare for than uh, 20 years ago, uh, both in terms of, uh, of conflicts on the ground, country specific situations and, and the thematic ones. Um, you know, the, the time to to uh, to be part of the council or be elected to the council uh, easily is described as, you know, uh, more, you know, more global tensions is a more challenging global situation than ever before. Um, in a way, we always hear that, that this year is a little bit more difficult than, than the past one. Uh, but to be realistic, uh, it is a challenging time uh, and we are prepared for that. Um, but it doesn't really, I mean, some of these things are a little bit exaggerated when it comes to dynamics in the council. Clearly, there are some kind of, you know, uh, well-known challenges that has been there for a long time. Uh, there are some new challenges as well. And, and I would maybe say the council is a little bit more fragmented or, or less predictable than the way it was before, but some of the fundamental uh, well-known tensions, uh, not just between the, uh, the the permanent fives, but but generally in the council as well, are still there. But it doesn't really mean that the uh, global, the increased global tensions, are reflected in any uh, and all of uh, the different uh, resolutions or presidential statements or press statements or even meetings that the council conducts or or uh, implements or decide some. So it's still possible to, to disentangle or, or disconnect some of these kind of tensions globally within the Council. And, and we believe it's much better to have all the key members and stakeholders inside the same room uh, than trying to resolve these challenges or, or tensions uh, bilaterally or through the uh, great power politics. But we are realistic and we are preparing for uh, difficult times, uh, but we also know that there are space, there are room to maneuvering. Um, there is kind of a, a legacy. Uh, Lise referred to some of them uh, in her presentation, but we have a number of elected members over the past decade uh, that has shown that it's possible to not necessarily uh, remove uh, the tensions between the permanent ones, but to to find openings and, and make some tweaks here and there. Uh, Sweden was mentioned, they did a fantastic job uh, through their period in 1718. Uh, Germany, Belgium, Estonia now, uh, the Netherlands, uh, New Zealand, Australia, Luxembourg. You have a long list of countries that on different files, be geographic or thematic, uh, that made changes uh, and improvements, both on the files and also in terms of working methods. So, um, so I think the, uh, and that has also improved, frankly, over the past years, is the efforts by the elected uh, members, the E10, uh, to work together and uh, have more regular dialogues um, and monthly meetings with the Secretary General so there are some kind of institutional improvements. Uh, it doesn't mean that all the elected members all will, always will agree politically, for sure not. But institutionally, there are some arrangements and, and practices that actually have, uh, have improved. Uh, in terms of priorities, briefly, uh, I mean, clearly preparing for a, a seat in the council is a demanding task. Uh, because the files are so numerous and, and the volume is heavy uh, in terms of the country files and the thematic files. 
Uh, by and large, uh, Norway has a key aim, of course, to, to do our best to make the Council as efficient and inclusive as possible. A challenge for us, as for all the elected members, uh, are clearly to, to, uh, to, to be able to prioritize within these kind of massive files and not be swamped uh, in, in every little corner of a Council discussion. Of course, we're preparing uh, for all the files. Uh, we will have positions uh, on all of them, uh, but we need to prioritize. Um, and and in, in that preparatory phase, uh, we have singled out, uh, obviously, some of the country files. I'm not going through all of them, uh, but there's a clear link between long-term Norwegian engagement uh, and role uh, in a certain conflict that is already subject uh, uh, for discussion in the Council uh, or is on the agenda of the Council. In terms of the thematic files, we have singled out four of them as kind of key priorities. Um, the one is, we call it peace diplomacy, but it's linked to the uh, preventive diplomacy or conflict prevention efforts by the Council. Uh, I'm not going into detail now, uh, but just briefly mentioning them. And the second one is the efforts to, to push the agenda, at least refer to some of these more thematic normative files. Uh, women, peace and security is the one. And the other one is protection of civilians, including children and armed conflict. And the fourth one is climate and security. And I think in a nutshell, uh, all of these uh, or these four priorities are interlinked and we are looking at and preparing for how to connect them uh, both thematically uh, and also look at how these as four thematic files could in a more efficient way be integrated in uh, when, when the country specific files uh, are being discussed and uh, decided upon in the Council. Uh, so that's to be said, I think, in terms of uh, overarching uh, priorities. Um, uh, at the end, uh, let me just briefly mentioning the um, uh, least referred to the Nordic Baltic uh, cooperation or, or uh, looking at Norway Estonia as, as, as a strong team. Uh, we obviously also have other European uh, like-minded in the Council. Uh, when Germany and Belgium leaves at the end of the year, we will have Ireland, uh, France <laughs> still there as a permanent member, and uh, and the uh, UK in a new position uh, post Brexit um, as permanent members. So the European dimension uh, of of the five European members in the Council, with also obviously. Uh, be an important uh, camp. Um, uh, and then we have the three African members. Uh, and we're also doing now consultations with all the, uh, not just the elected ones, but permanent members as well, uh, to, to sketch out and, and look at uh, areas where we can cooperate uh, together or in uh, larger teams. And, and that cooperation obviously will cross to whether you're a P5 or, or an elected member. So uh, with those words, I think I just leave it there and we could come back in, in Q&A session. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Andreas. Uh, now we will move to the researcher side of things and we will hear again both from the Norwegian and Estonian side. Our next speaker is Christy Reik, who is director of FB, the Estonian Foreign Policy Institute. Uh, and she's also an adjunct professor at the University of Turku. Uh, and she is, in addition, the project manager of this project on multilateralism and Estonia and Norway. So, Christy, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Christine. And uh, first, of course, I want to thank uh, Nubi for uh, very smooth cooperation thus far on getting this project uh, started. Uh, I think we found uh, an agreement uh, very quickly on, on the importance of the topic, how uh, great moment it is having both Estonia and Norway in the UN Security Council to actually do some deeper analysis on that. It's of course very unfortunate that we could not come to Oslo, which was the original plan, 
but uh, we are still hopeful that uh, next year we can actually host you physically in Tallinn for the next events uh, of the project. But now to my um, remarks, um, I would like to look uh, a bit at the broader picture and highlight uh, some global challenges to multilateralism. Some of them have been uh, mentioned already. Uh, then also to look at uh, some efforts to um, tackle these uh, challenges and uh, point to some uh, maybe more structural like shared interests of uh, Estonia and uh, Norway. Uh, but starting from uh, the challenges, uh, what we have seen in the past uh, few years is um, the world uh, moving towards uh, less of a global order. Uh, we see the world getting more fragmented. Uh, there are stronger regional centers of uh, power, uh, regional structures being built up, uh, contestation of uh, global norms and uh, replacement uh, to some extent with uh, more uh, regional uh, setups. Uh, which is a result of a number of uh, developments. Uh, first uh, is uh, the withdrawal of uh, the United States from its uh, previous uh, very strong role as a global leader. Uh, secondly, of course, the rise of uh, China and the US-China competition, which was mentioned uh, and has become a dominant factor in world politics. And uh, thirdly, from um, our regional perspective uh, in particular, one should mention also that there are other uh, competitors that uh, wish to get rid of the US uh, hegemony and have a shared interest in um, moving towards a multipolar world order, uh, including uh, Russia. So, of course, this has affected uh, the way UN uh, structures operate. Uh, the UN has again, become more an arena for great power struggle. And in this situation, uh, it's um, good to remember that every institution is as uh, strong as its uh, participating states uh, make it to be. Uh, once a seasoned diplomat uh, told me about a diplomatic mission that uh, it is not so important what you do, but uh, most importantly, you have to be present and active. And uh, to some degree, it applies very well to the UN and its uh, Security Council in order to keep it valid. Uh, states uh, need to be active and even states uh, that do not necessarily share our view on, for example, human rights uh, norms. If they still work uh, through the UN uh, structures, it helps to keep uh, the organization uh, valid. Um, in, in Estonia, um, when Estonia was applying for the Security Council membership, uh, there were um, quite uh, heated uh, discussions actually about uh, whether this was the right uh, priority or whether Estonia should uh, spend its uh, limited uh, resources on uh, more important priorities. And indeed, uh, the existential organizations for Estonia are elsewhere, uh, above all NATO and the European Union. Uh, and the Estonian foreign policy has been in the past decades very much uh, focused on um, uh, Western allies and organizations. Uh, but at the same time, as a small state, uh, Estonia has always uh, underlined the importance of international law and multilateral cooperation. And uh, in that sense, I think uh, Estonia cannot afford not to be engaged actively also in the UN and there are global trends also um, increasing uh, the importance of a stronger global outlook in addition to this focus on Western uh, Western um, uh, alliance. Um, so coming back to the US role because it is so important uh, for us and being not a diplomat I can uh, speak about it uh, more freely than uh, our colleagues from the foreign ministries. Uh, we have seen in the past uh, years, uh, to some extent, decreased engagement of uh, the US in the UN structures. Uh, one can also say that uh, during Trump's presidency, the US uh, has not been an ally in defending multilateralism. Uh, whether that will change as a result of the presidential elections, we still don't know what the outcome uh, will be. 
but uh, the changes that uh, have taken place uh, anyway um, matter for our future efforts. And uh, it has been uh, noted that China and Russia have been working more together and kind of uh, challenging uh, the other uh, permanent uh, uh, members and not only permanent members of the Security Council. Um, and they have uh, gained more uh, space to operate uh, because of this uh, weakened uh, presence uh, of the US. And just to give a very concrete example of uh, the strength and role of uh, China. China has been uh, successful in uh, gaining uh, leadership of uh, four UN agencies. It's uh, quite a lot uh, and we have also seen strong influence of China on the uh, uh, global health uh, organization. Um, but then um, as a kind of side effect of this great power uh, tensions and uh, changing dynamics of uh, great power balance, uh, we have seen efforts uh, by other countries um, to, to counter these trends uh, and uh, many of them have been mentioned actually already by the previous uh, speakers. Uh, we have seen a clear increase uh, of cooperation among EU member states in the UN and especially in the Security Council. Um, after uh, the um, last uh, previous uh, presidential elections of the US when Trump uh, uh, became president, uh, it had this uh, effect of uh, both France and the UK uh, becoming much more uh, interested in um, promoting European cooperation in, in the Security Council. And uh, now that France uh, has become the only EU member state in the Security Council, it really has an important role in, in um, uh, coordinating among EU member states and it has shown more interest than to engage also the uh, elected um, smaller uh, member states in the European cooperation. And as a concrete uh, indication, we have seen multiplication of uh, uh, the number of uh, joint uh, stakeouts of uh, EU member states in the Security Council over the past uh, years. Um, but then uh, we also need to broaden from the EU and uh, look at uh, European cooperation, especially due to Brexit. Uh, it has become more important to coordinate uh, among European countries beyond the EU and of course this also applies then to Norway and, and here is one, I think, uh, very clear shared interest of Estonia and Norway to uh, work for this uh, broader European uh, coordination uh, in the Security Council. Uh, then thirdly, we have seen more um, coordination among elected members, which was mentioned. I will not say anything more about that. And, and uh, in addition, there have been other initiatives kind of trying to show that uh, multilateralism still matters. Uh, for example, this initiative led by France and Germany to, to launch uh, the Alliance of uh, Multilateralists, uh, which uh, was an effort to, to show that uh, there are uh, not only Western uh, like-minded countries, but uh, also non-Western partners that uh, still think it is important to uh, support uh, multilateral cooperation. Um, so uh, the initiative included a number of also non-Western non countries such as Ghana and Mexico and Singapore. Um, now um, one more shared interest of uh, Estonia and uh, Norway. I have been uh, uh, making some very critical remarks of the re reduced uh, US engagement, uh, but uh, nonetheless it's obvious that uh, for both uh, Estonia and Norway in our foreign policies uh, the transatlantic uh, relationship remains uh, hugely important. And uh, what was the major concern of Estonia upon joining uh, the Security Council was that uh, this would put Estonia in a very uncomfortable position uh, because it would have to visibly choose sides on matters where Europeans and the US uh, disagree in the Security Council. 
And of course, uh, we have had uh, these uh, disagreements uh, also before the Trump era, so it's not a new uh, phenomenon. And uh, indeed, uh, there have been these uh, difficult uh, moments, uh, for example, related to the Middle East uh, peace process. Uh, but we have seen uh, a diplomatic effort of Estonia to do as much as possible to bridge these uh, divisions and, and uh, to kind of um, find some kind of compromise formulations uh, um, that uh, still uh, while uh, recognizing the disagreements uh, highlight uh, the commitment of uh, Europeans also to the transatlantic uh, partnership. So we will see how uh, this dynamic uh, will change uh, in, in future if, if uh, the US uh, elections bring a change. But then as a final point, um, I would like to recall that uh, Estonia actually joined uh, the United Nations only in 1991. After regaining independence uh, following decades of uh, Soviet occupation, and we know from experience that uh, the UN security norms have been violated before. Uh, um, they did not apply to Estonia during the Cold War era. And uh, today, when we look at the Eastern European region, uh, we see violations of security and human rights norms in a number of places. Lee's uh, mentioned them. And it's very much uh, natural for Estonia to have it as a priority to um, draw the attention of the global community to these violations and to send this message that uh, violations need to have uh, consequences. So Estonia has been active in bringing to the UN agenda um, issues related to Ukraine, Crimea, uh, Georgia, uh, Belarus, and of course, this has been uh, very irritating to one of the permanent uh, Security Council uh, members. But it's a crucial matter for Estonia that uh, no country should be allowed to impose its uh, sphere of influence on uh, smaller neighbors uh, by force. That's uh, not a way to reach uh, stability. On the contrary, it uh, reduces stability and security. So um, that uh, remains an important uh, priority. And when we look at the UN uh, Charter today that uh, defines these core security norms, uh, it still looks very much valid. It's very important that it provides uh, the basis uh, for um, calling out uh, and condemning states that violate these rules and to try to work towards uh, their better, better implementation. I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction, Christy. Uh, our last speaker this morning is Nils Nagel-Lucia, who's a re senior research fellow at NUPI and who's also a coordinator of NUPI's Cybersecurity Center. So Nils, we look forward to hearing your presentation before we move over to the discussion. You need to unmute. Thank you very much, Christine. Can you hear me now? Yes, I have a PowerPoint, so I will try to make it visible for you. Uh, give me just two seconds. Can you see it there? Yeah, OK. So in. Um, in my presentation, I will um, look at the uh, five topics which I think is important uh, when you try to understand the Security Council and uh, the small states and the role they can play in the Security Council. So uh, the first one is, um, is a brief historical overview. Uh, and then I will look at uh, the room for maneuver for elected member states. And uh, thirdly, I will look a bit uh, on why, about why a seat in the Security Council, Council is important for Norway. Uh, and fourthly, I will look at what existing research on the Security Council say about internal dynamics and ways of influence. 
And finally, I will look at to what extent the Security Council is capable of adapting to shifting circumstances in international relations and, and to adapt to new security threats. So uh, the room for small states to maneuver in the Council has changed uh, through history. Uh, during the Cold War, the Security Council was very much paralyzed uh, by the tensions between the US and the Soviet Union, and uh, many, many re resolutions was, uh, was blocked by the veto. Then in the 90s, the Cold War uh, had ended and there was a good climate for multilateralism. And we could see a major increase in resolutions that was uh, adopted. During this period, the possibilities for the elected member states uh, to influence uh, increased. Then in the immediate aftermath of 9-11 in 2001, the Security Council was very active and adopted several important resolutions. And the US enjoyed um, a lot of goodwill. Uh, this was also a good period for multilateralism. But in the last decade, we have seen that uh, multilateralism has been put under pressure and that the tensions between the veto powers has increased. And there are things indicating that, uh, but, but there are things uh, actually indicating that even though the P5 sometimes are paralyzed, the previous speakers has also touched upon this, but even though they, uh, there are tensions between the P5, that this is also something that provides opportunities and perhaps sometimes leeway to, to the elected member states and to, to really try to take initiative on things. And we saw that in Sweden and uh, how they, they pushed through a resolution on Syria, for instance, during their membership. Um, another interesting long-term trend is um, uh, what I've described as uh, the three waves of the Security Council. So the first wave is uh, was, was most of the Cold War. Uh, that was when the Council was occupied with in interstate conflict. The second wave was um, began in the 90s, and then the Council expanded its mandate to, to include internal conflicts. And then more recently, we have seen a third wave of evolution in the Council's mandate, and this is the thematic agenda, where the Council is discussing topics like climate change, pandemics, and, and cybersecurity. So uh, the long term trend can be seen as an evolution moving from ideas of national security to, to ideas of human security. And uh, this uh, long term trend, uh, not all, of course, not leaving national security, this is still on, on the table, but, but also including human security. And uh, so this long term trend is also potentially giving small states more leeway and room to maneuver in the council because there's more topics and uh, various kind of topics on the table uh, in the council. There's actually more work. So, um, moving to look at uh, a little bit on room for maneuver, and I think there are three important factors when you when you want to look at uh, the room for maneuver of uh, small states. And uh, the formal setup of the council is the first one. This uh, this is set. Uh, it's not worth the effort for an elected country to, to try to change this setup during the membership. Uh, there are 15 member states. Five of these are permanent veto powers and 10 are elected and they're sitting for two years and they have to do the best they can with that position in the two years there are member. So from the outside, this may paint a very static picture of the Security Council, but, but if you look closely, the Council is in fact quite uh, dynamic. And um, there have been uh, a lot of changes uh, in the Council's way of working, especially in the informal processes and the everyday practices. So, um, so knowing how to play this game uh, and knowing the informal processes the channels of uh, influence, that's very important for the diplomats, especially from elected countries, that's only there for two years. And uh, if you know this very well, you will have more leeway and be able to influence the council even better. 
I will get back to this in a few 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 slides. Um, and the, uh, the third factor is uh, that the in, uh, internal dynamics in the council. They are uh, also affected by the tensions between the veto powers, of course. Even though it is possible to disentangle that, like uh, Andreas uh, said, I totally agree with that, but uh, they are. They are affected by 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 the tensions as, as well. Um, so say a little bit about why why uh, membership uh, in the council is important for Norm Norway and it has to do with the uh, long traditions in in Norwegian foreign politics uh, and, and also the size of Norway and where we're geographically situated so uh, first of all multilateral multilateralism has always been key in Norwegian foreign politics uh, Norway has had a lot of resources to draw on and it's a very competent UN player both in New York and 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 Norway and the Security Council is always uh, is, is uh, always as good as uh, the member states in the council are and I think that uh, being a long term player in, 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 within, in within the United Nations and also a competent UN player Norway will contribute to pull the council in a positive direction. Um, uh, the, the, the membership is also an opportunity to increase Norway's influence, of course, and an important topic uh, for Norway and Norwegian foreign policy. They, they we're sitting around the table and we're having a voice and and we're having a say. So, and the, the, the fourth point here is that it will increase the status of Norway internationally, we will have the Security Council is uh, the catwalk in many ways for international politics, and uh, you are very visible when you, when you're there, and you, you, there's a good opportunity to build network and you get contacts, and, and yeah, so the spotlights are on. So a little bit about the experiences, uh, Norwegian experiences from 2001, 2002. I will not go very deep into that, just uh, highlight the most uh, important ones. Um, and, and one particularly important thing to say here is that uh, the council is very dominated or, or the agenda of the crisis and the work, the agenda of the council and the work of the council is very dominated by crisis uh, international crisis and after uh, Norway joined the, the Security Council in January 2001 and after nine months 9-11 uh, happened and this uh, the aftermath of 9-11 uh, was in many ways dominating the remaining work uh, or the remaining period uh, Norwegian period but uh, uh, nevertheless, Norway during these two years was very aware of what kind of cases it was possible to influence and what kind of cases it was difficult to influence. So the most burning topic was, of course, as I said, 9-11. And these cases was, they were handled by the US and, and the P5. And it, it was very difficult to, to, to have a very, very big impact on these cases. So Norway chose to take lead on important cases, but uh, important cases that had a lower big politics tension, such as the Horn of Africa, for instance. Um, and we also had a, held a very time consuming uh, committee. It was the sanction committee on Iraq. So this was a lot of work and, uh, and it was not very much it, it, it wasn't very possible to, to, to influence very much on this. It was just work that had to be done and, and was going on. And, and it's very likely that we will get another sanction committee when we, we join. That probably Andreas can say more about that. Yeah, and then um, yeah, we also managed during our presidency last time, we also managed to push through a resolution on Palestine. So that is also uh, something we did. And uh, yeah, I will say a little bit about internal dynamics in the council and ways to influence. 
and there are several ways to influence in, uh, there. You have the presidency, uh, which is a good opportunity to in, uh, opportunity. And uh, normally, each elected uh, member states uh, states have um, have uh, two times during their their period uh, in the council. But uh, this time, Norway has been a little bit uh, unlucky with the alphabetical order uh, of the states in the council. So we will only have one presidency during our membership. So that means that we need to really push on this one to 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 get important topics on the table and and to to organize uh, meetings and and things like that. So um, another one is the the pen holder function. All the previous speakers have also talked about uh, that one. Uh, the pen holder initiatives. It's it's basically about taking initiative on all aspects concerning a situation and uh, drafting possible resolutions. So that's a good way of of uh, influencing uh, the council. Uh, yeah. It's very consensus focused, so it is important to 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 be a team player and you also have um, a difference between the, the elected member states and the permanent member states because uh, you, can, you can say that uh, uh, the permanent member states have a whole range of informal advantages. They are repeat players and are typically larger and better resourced and their stakes in any given individual case are smaller relative in the long run. Elected member states can be described as one shotters and uh, perhaps as uh, have not uh, compared with the P5. Uh, they are smaller units with higher stakes in any given, in given case. This difference gives the repeat players more or, or the P5 more power and influence than what is captured through the permanent membership and the veto power alone. And the P5 know the rules of the game better than the elected states and are often effectively able to take control of conf conflict situations in, in the council without making use of the, the veto power. Yeah, and um, finally the uh, adaptability of the council. When looking at the formal composition and the rules of procedure, the council looks uh, static as I've um, already said. Um, and this is also unlikely to change in the future. But uh, there's a lot of informal processes and it's also uh, shifting international circumstances. And uh, in, in uh, recent years, the Council's ability to be a key player at the center of international peace and security has uh, been a little bit undermined by the growing divisions. The delayed response to, to COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, is one example uh, on how this plays out in the Council. Issues on uh, climate change and cybersecurity are also topics that uh, are increasingly or at least dividing the Council. But in order to remain relevant in the 21st century, the Security Council will need to find uh, out how to deal better with uh, such new security threats. And um, my final point is that um, it needs to be uh, able to adapt to these, uh, these changes uh, in order to stay relevant. Because it's very important for the Security Council to stay relevant and to be able to act upon uh, security threats and, and conflicts uh, because you always have the the fate of the League of Nations lurking in, in the back because they they got uh, irrelevant very after, after only two decades and was uh, was dissolved. So that's that's a very important uh, thing to keep in mind that the, the Security Council has to adapt to to a changing world and in order to stay relevant and to. Question. 
Okay, that was uh, it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nils. Uh, if you click on the button where you stop sharing the screen, then we we were all back on the on the main screen. Uh, so thank you all for very uh, good presentations and for, for sort of setting the stage here and raising a number of, of issues. I would have liked to pick up on many of them, but I think I will, will uh, before we, we start with some of the questions from the audience, I thought I would pick up, up on something that I think you all mentioned. I think you all mentioned the period of Sweden as a uh, an elected member who managed somehow to leave a footprint on the UN Security Council agenda. Uh, and that made me think, what uh, is success in this context? So how do we deem a successful, or how do we evaluate a successful period as a, as a non-permanent uh, member of the UN Security Council? Because in a sense, one would assume that all the states who are rotating members would, in a, you know, in retrospect, they would say that, yes, it was a successful uh, membership. So how do we sort of uh, deem the criteria for what a successful period is? And then secondly, also picking up on something I think many of you mentioned, uh, Niels, you used uh, the nice term catwalk in terms of describing how this uh, also is an opportunity for states to to position themselves in the international uh, on the international arena and, and to sort of leave a footprint. And then at the same time, many of you also talked about the importance of, of finding coalitions with like minded partners working together on influencing the agenda. And is there potentially a tension between these two uh, ambitions in a sense? Because uh, obviously states would want to leave their footprint, but then uh, how many people can or how, how many states can share the spotlight on the catwalk, so to speak, to use Nitz's term. Um, so I would like to challenge you on that. Uh, maybe Lise, I could ask you to, to respond first. Or, and also if you would like to respond to things that other participants mentioned, that is of course also possible. Uh, thank you. Very shortly, uh, I recall the climate and security file where Sweden concrete, concretely paved the way to where we are now with this discussion and, uh, and uh, made sure that the file is being carefully picked up uh, by another country and also I recall Sweden pushing the normative human rights framework into the resolutions and uh, this is um, something that we can measure when we see the text for example. I'm not saying this is the only criteria but uh, these are just uh, a few examples and more generally how to measure a success. Uh, much has been discussed here about this catwalk and public diplomacy ar arena, then one success is when a country uh, is not silent on uh, sufferings taking place around the world. So often, as I mentioned, elected members are those bringing up these issues to the public uh, limelight, enabling to um, create an atmosphere where facts on the ground are being taken under public scrutiny. And uh, when we speak about the massive human rights violations or even international crimes, then this is an um, very important task. Thank you. Uh, Andreas? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Christian. And just to add uh, on these uh, points, uh, I think I, I would just warn against uh, concluding by uh, by narrowing uh, down kind of an assessment to one single reason or one single outcome or result. Uh, I think when the generally or the majority of member states would look back uh, not just with Sweden frankly but uh, with with many other like-minded elected members over the past decade but Sweden in particular I think uh, by and large uh, is remembered for uh, in its uh, comprehensiveness uh, in, in uh, being very active on many files at the same time both thematic and, and country specific uh, of course, they uh, in 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 um, maintaining that kind of stamina uh, during the two years term. Of course, they annoyed some of the P5s or other members, uh, but but I think that was necessary in in the times of difficulties. Um, 
they maintained and pushed further some of the like what Lisa referred to some of the normative files human rights in in some critical situations uh, in in certain countries that came up uh, in the council uh, for discussions uh, humanitarian access uh, in Syria was not novel or was not actually first time but they they pushed it further uh, it was frankly picked up first by um, by Australia and uh, Luxembourg in, in uh, 13 or 14. Um, so, so I think it was the uh, combination of uh, uh, many different tools and that they also didn't go for only one shot or one single event during their presidency. Uh, they had the message, uh, overarching message of, of uh, pushing for a feminist foreign policy, uh, but that was not just narrowed down to uh, implementation of the women, peace and security agenda. Uh, but they, they, they broaden up things and they included the thematic uh, issues in, in the different country specific files. So I think it was the comprehensive kind and they also were very visible. Uh, their uh, PR was uh, very accessible, very active uh, before and after not just public meetings, but also the cl uh, closed consultations. Um, so, so I think uh, in general, I mean, it was not just a number of resolutions or outcomes of the council they, they pushed for, but, but I think the general, uh, also from the civil society side, they felt that Sweden was picking up uh, the normative voice as well. Thank you. Uh, Kirsti? Thank you. These are very good questions. Um, on how to measure uh, success, um, I would uh, make a distinction between short term and long term, which you know, previous uh, speakers have also referred to. Uh, in the short term, indeed, uh, it is a matter a lot of uh, just being very active, being visible, uh, bringing issues to the agenda, highlighting your priorities. Uh, but then the longer term uh, challenge uh, is how to contribute to the norm building process. And uh, that's something where also elected members can have a more uh, lasting influence, but it is not necessarily as uh, visible in the short term. Um, cyber norms being one example here where uh, I think Lise mentioned that uh, it's a matter of uh, decades uh, to strengthen international law in the cyberspace. And uh, Estonia has been investing a lot in this. And, and uh, this brings me to your second question. Uh, there is this tension between uh, wish to be visible. Uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes there is a tension, not necessarily always, on the one hand. And then on the other hand, uh, the need to build coalitions very patiently and uh, do the work behind the scenes, uh, look at the kind of long term, uh, long term view and not just the daily uh, visibility. Uh, and that's, of course, uh, one of the kind of core uh, tasks of uh, diplomats to find this uh, balance in their everyday work. I think diplomats actually often do most of their work behind the scenes and they are used to it and uh, good diplomats are, are uh, measured, measured to an important extent by their ability to do so and, and kind of avoid uh, the temptation always to gain maximum uh, visibility. Um, and this is uh, uh, something that is a very interesting dynamic when we look at the elected members in the UN Security Council that have this uh, short period of uh, time uh, to be at the catwalk, so to say, and uh, they want to make the maximum uh, use of it, uh, but uh, still uh, they should keep in mind this uh, slow work of coalition building and uh, norm building. Thanks. Thank you very much, Kiste. Nils, would you like to add something as well? Unmute. Yes, thank you very much, Kristin. Uh, Sorry about that. Um, very good questions, I think. And um, I think that I would try to, to, to look at both of them 
uh, as one because I think that um, if you want to look at what success means when you are in the Security Council, you have to look at the, the double responsibility in a way you take on when you when you go to the Security Council to be a member because you have the responsibility as uh, of, of your national interests uh, from your government and the foreign politics, but you also take on a responsibility for an efficient and well working Security Council. So this means that uh, you have to be a team player, but you also have to try to to in a way push your uh, priorities uh, diplomatically so that it uh, it works well with the uh, with the Security Council and and you and the Security Council Security Council remains efficient. So one success I think for each elected member states one one criteria is uh, that you have to look back and look at uh, the two years that you have been there. Was was the Security Council working efficiently and did you contribute to to an efficient Security Council? But that because that's that's a responsibility and then you have to be consensus focused and you have to be a team player and you have to be in a way part of the parade. But you 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 have to um, you have to remember your your national priorities all the way, of course. But then um, um, uh, I will also say that uh, this was very important uh, for Norway during the previous membership, that, that uh, Norway was a contributor to a well functioning Security Council and an efficient Security Council. But when you look back and then you talk with people um, that are interested in 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 that period, they will al always if you if you ask them what what did Norway do in the council they will they will mention a couple of things they will mention the the resolution on palestine they will mention the horn of africa and they will mention a couple of things like that so this is this is also a measure of, of success of course and but the, there's a there's a you have to there's a very fine-tuned balance there you have you don't want to flag too much but you you don't want to forget about your national priorities either thanks Thank you all. Uh, we have a number of questions coming in and unfortunately we don't have time to address them all, but I will try to, to gather a few into, into one question or, or two questions that I will uh, also ask you to, to reflect upon. And the first is, is really, so th this, this UN Security Council period of Norway 20 years ago uh, has been mentioned. That was also a chal challenging period in international politics. There were major events that, that followed. Um, so if I could challenge you to, to say a few words about what you believe in the, if you look into the crystal ball, what will 2021 bring in terms of major international challenges that need to be tackled? And we have questions that have come in, both in terms of Russia's role in the neighborhood, I think Christy, you explicitly addressed this, uh, but also cybersecurity, as you mentioned, Nils. And there's also a question here about, um, how countering corruption and global organized crime, how that uh, or whether that will come to the agenda of the UN Security Council as well. And then a final question, which is also come in, which I think is a good one, uh, which is a question concerning uh, the extent to which Estonia and Norway will also strive to bring on board to the UN Security Council the viewpoints of partners that are not. So, for example, the wider Nordic Baltic region, but also EU member states. Uh, many have mentioned these like minded states and how they operate. And I think we will go in the same order as the previous time. So, so Lise, maybe you go first. Uh, thank you. So major challenges for 2021. Mm. It's widely said, Christy outlined some uh, broader trends uh, well, so it's widely said that probably we see acceleration of certain trends, um, big power, big power in big power relations. And of course, um, it, the, the year is influenced by the outcome of uh, the elections we are all closely monitoring. Uh, another trend that I would like to mention is maybe this uh, uh, how the diplomat diplomacy had to adapt to the COVID era. We don't know yet, as I mentioned, how does it influence 
the outcome of diplomatic work, the fact that we do um, so-called Zoom diplomacy, that WhatsApp ch chats, um, these can't replace the corridor diplomacy for getting the consensus. And uh, one colleague has said that you have a very di different group dynamic on a video platform. There isn't the same pressure to compromise you would experience if you were in the same room and it's easier to hide behind your own screen. So what does it mean that whole international organizations are sitting behind the screens? For a longer time, we imagined uh, um, So I don't have answer, but I'm just throwing it out here. And what else was the question? Maybe you can help me out. Yes, the, the second question was concerning whether Norway would Norway and Estonia would bring on board viewpoints from both other European partners and perhaps in particular the Nordic Baltic countries. Right. Um, sure, that is how we do our diplomacy. We have regular briefings in the Nordic Baltic group, by exchange of views, what is happening also in the Council. We have always said we are open to viewpoints. We've been consulting on certain issues with our regional uh, friends. That's the way diplomacy works. We see that we are not there only as Estonia, but of course as a well-connected uh, country with allies and friends. Thank you. Uh, Andreas? Yeah, thank you again for a very, uh, very uh, well thought question or questions. Um, uh, I believe that, I mean, I will not keep my crystal ball in my hands, uh, that always very stupid uh, from a scientific or even political point of view. Um, but I, I mean, generally looking ahead into the next year, uh, as I said, we're planning for kind of everything, but you cannot plan for, I mean, planning is usually the more important side of things than actually what the plan is. Um, uh, I think to answer this, uh, always kind of sudden uh, evolving situations on the ground may, I mean, that is what we will have to plan for, that that may more or less likely happen in 2021, uh, whether it's in that region or another region. I mean, the Arab Spring was one, uh, you know, obvious example, and, and we have other kind of frozen conflicts at the moment that are now uh, more uh, more um, into the open and, and uh, is challenging uh, international peace and security. Um, in terms of the more generic uh, thematic issues that, that you refer to, like cyber, organized crime, uh, could include climate uh, or the impact of climate change on security as well. In a way or another, all of these kind of themes uh, are already in a way or another uh, subject for uh, different kind of discussions. I mean, they are already, if, if not they're uh, not yet formally uh, uh, on the Council's agenda, they, they in a way or another are included in, in the different kind of country specific situations uh, or even as thematic situations. So even if you're not yet having a Security Council resolutions on climate change and security, uh, we have a presidential statement a uh, decade ago, uh, but it's regularly being discussed. So the key question is not really whether these issues are uh, being discussed in the council, but it's more what kind of outcomes or impact may happen. Um, I don't think we will see any major breakthrough uh, on these files. It's more about building on or maintaining and preserving uh, the kind of foundation or the framework we have for some of these thematic files. Uh, avoid any kind of um, uh, you know, pushback or, or uh, weakening of, of, of the existing kind of texts uh, we uh, or, or uh, the kind of the consensus we have at the moment. Um, so I think that's more the kind of main question. How do you make progress on these files? Uh, I don't see kind of a, uh, there's no reason to believe that there will be a major breakthrough. I mean, we have some critical elections, but uh, but in terms of the, the overarching dynamics in the council will not disappear or uh, we have to be realistic about how we're managing to, to working with, uh, with those dynamics. So if there's going to be a major challenge or major kind of, um, you know, sudden issue, I, I believe it's more related to a regional or country specific situation. 
Um, yeah, I like what I said in the beginning uh, in terms of um, uh, inclusivity and, you know, um, uh, as with Estonia and Orwell, we push for a more transparent, but meanwhile, efficient council. Uh, we were elected by 130 uh, member states, so obviously it's part of that responsibility is also to ensure that there are, you know, close connections, regular dialogues, it doesn't mean that Norway does not have a national interest in defending in the council, but obviously our national interest is also very anchored um, in, in, the, um, uh, in the international kind of context. So obviously European partners beyond the, uh, the four other European members in the council, uh, we will, you know, even if it's not an EU member, we, we're having regular dialogues. Um, and, and we'll keep them um, informed and also involved and, and, uh, and to listening to their voice and views. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have time for very brief, if you could keep it short, Christian and Nils, and try to, to say your best thoughts in, in a minute or so each, uh, then we will be on time when we conclude this seminar. Christy, please. Uh, yes, uh, very shortly. Uh, I don't uh, want to predict either, but just uh, highlight uh, what also Nils mentioned, the new security threats issues that uh, will be with us uh, no matter uh, what uh, election results we have in this or that country. Uh, but the first is uh, digitalization of societies. It's not just having an impact of, on diplomacy, but it's a very broad issue for uh, the future of our lives, on the, the impact on the economies, the impact on maybe new kinds of social cleavages and uh, tensions uh, between and within countries, um, and new kinds of uh, risks uh, to our safety and security. Uh, then uh, secondly, climate obviously remains as a big issue and it's uh, very much possible that uh, the next uh, big global catastrophe uh, will be in the field of uh, climate. Uh, and then thirdly, health security remains an issue. Um, uh, even if uh, COVID is overcome, uh, what uh, specialists uh, say is that the risk of uh, pandemics will be increasing in the uh, future and uh, the credibility of the multilateral system will uh, depend on its ability to deal with uh, this kind of new security threats. But then on, on Russia, just one, one uh, sentence, uh, it's clear that uh, the Security Council is not uh, the place to prevent or solve conflicts in the post-Soviet space, unfortunately. But uh, what is uh, very important is that the UN Charter remains, at least in principle, acknowledged as a core document and uh, something that then provides the basis for raising these conflicts uh, also in the Security Council. Thanks. Okay, Nils. Uh, thank you, uh, Kirsti. And Nils, you have 30 seconds. Uh, you can stretch it to 40. All right. I, I don't want to say anything about what will happen in the future. The best uh, example of uh, this is that we don't know anything about it because we didn't know anything about Corona one year ago and now we're sitting here, right? So then I will focus more about um, more on, on cyber security since there was one question concerning that. So that's one of the new uh, security threats. And uh, this is a very difficult question for the Security Council. There's a uh, power lines has to be drawn. Uh, P5 is very, they, they disagree fundamentally on, on a lot of important topics here, but, but it's nevertheless an important issue. It's also difficult for the Security Council because uh, all the cyber attacks or operations, they're uh, usually uh, low threshold attacks or operations. So they're, they're um, uh, dodging uh, international law, uh, but they're still affecting international peace and security. And, uh, and it could be that uh, in Norway, there has been more attention to this, these questions um, uh, because of uh, big uh, attack on uh, hydro, which was very costly. And then just recently, uh, some uh, digital burglars or, or uh, break-ins to, to Norwegian parliamentarians uh, inboxes and the Norwegian parliament. So this is, this is becoming a more and more pressing and important 
uh, question, which is also global and uh, can affect the international peace and security. So this is something that I think that the Security Council needs to to mature. Yeah. Thank you very much, Nils. Uh, time flies when we have important discussions like this. I would like to thank our speakers for their great introductions and also for engaging with the quite difficult questions uh, that were raised here. I would like to thank everyone who listened in and everyone who said questions. I apologize that we didn't have time to address them all. If uh, anyone would like to see this seminar again, it will be posted on Nupi's YouTube channel and be available after this event. Uh, and you can also follow the project uh, Estonia, Norway and the UN Security Council on NUPI's website as well as on FP's website. We will post updates and there will be a report available later during the project. So thank you all uh, and I wish you all a pleasant day. Thank you for listening in and thank you for coming to this seminar. <laughs>